Welcome. Today we will be looking at the notes worksheet entitled Vectors. And you probably have a pretty good background in your science classes dealing with vectors. Uh, but what I will probably do today is uh, add more of a trigonometric perspective to it. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, just a little definition, a little sketch, and you know, start getting some of the algebra and trigonometry related together here. So uh, at the top of your page, it should say vectors are directed line segments that represent quantities having, and here are the two key characteristics, so if you don't mind underlining those. So it is a quantity that has a size and it has a direction, and we will need to mathematically define both. So let's go ahead and just do a little sketch on your paper. And so really what we're going to do is start from an initial point right there. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to kind of label that P and uh, sort of call that my initial point. If you get an opportunity, go ahead and throw that in there. So there's your initial point starting at a particular spot. And then um, sort of the length will represent the size. And obviously the direction will be an angle off of the standard position. So it'll look maybe something like that right there, a directed line segment. So from one endpoint to another endpoint, your initial point to a terminal point. And so let me go ahead and put that right in here. So P to potentially I'll call that Q. So from P to Q. And notice it is a line segment, but it has a direction, meaning a starting point and an end point. And so from P to Q would look something like this. And basically the length, as I had alluded to, the length will be the size that we will talk about. And then the direction will be more of an angle. And we'll talk about that angle as an angle in standard position or maybe as a bearing as well. So we'll see both those come into play. All right, so nice little sketch right there. And then what we're going to do is represent these a couple different ways. And so this is the first way, the algebraic representation of vectors. So I'm just going to call my vector V. So something like that right there. And so my vector V is really made up of two true components, a horizontal component and a vertical component. And so throw that in if you don't mind, those four parts right there. And uh, we have our AI working together to talk about the horizontal piece and the BJ working together to talk about the vertical piece. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw a couple of those ideas right here. As you can see on your paper, I have A, B, and I and J. And so really I would consider the A working in conjunction with the I, but really it is the A that talks about the horizontal component, the numerical value horizontally. So horizontal component of the vector and the B value. We we'll really talk about how far we're going vertically. So let me just make sure I have that right for you. So it will be the, the vertical component of the vector. So let me get that in as well. And again, that works in conjunction with the J, which we'll talk about momentarily. But the numerical value will be B. So vertical component of that vector. So those are the two numerical values, one telling you where to go horizontally, the other where to go vertically. Now the I and the J in some respects is, is just sort of a redundancy. It reinforces um, which direction you're going. So A and B represent the numerical values. I and J represent sort of the, the variable, which will be the, really the, the direction. And so here's the official definition of it. I is what's called the unit vector along the positive x-axis. And all that really does, everyone, is just tells us that we're going to move horizontally however many units that A tells us to move. So unit vector along the positive x, again, really just reinforcing the horizontal. And then as a result, the J would be what is called the unit vector along the positive y-axis. And again, really all that does is, is it reinforces the fact that the B is telling us to go vertically. Okay, so these two work in together, one numerical, one variable, to go ahead and tell us where to go horizontally. And then same here, this is the vertical component. And so this tells us this is the numerical, how far to go vertically, and this reinforces that we are going vertically. 
So those are the things that we'll kind of be looking at here, and we'll go ahead and take a look at a little graphical connection with this momentarily, and then again, sort of relate it to the trigonometry, and you'll see the same math um, form that we've been looking at over the last week or two. All right, well, let's go for it. So there's an example just on your paper, and it just says sketch the vector, uh, v equals negative 5i plus 2j. So again, you see the uh, a and b values, numerical in nature. I is going to tell us to go horizontally this many units. J is going to tell us to go vertically this many units. And so the nice thing about this is theoretically we can start and end pretty much at any position on the coordinate plane. So the, the good news here is you get to pick your initial point. Now, anywhere you'd like on the coordinate plane would work. I would probably argue that the origin is the easiest place to start for our purposes here. So I'm going to go ahead and start our vector at the origin. But it should be noted, this would work if I started anywhere and follow the directions of our vector. And that's basically all this is. It's telling us to go a certain number of units in certain directions. And so when I see negative 5i and then plus 2j, it basically is starting at an initial point, and the negative 5i tells me to go 5 units to the left. So the negative 5, of course, and let me just make sure I have this right, 2, 3, 4, 5, good. So 5 units to the left, and the 2j tells me to go 2 units up. And so from initial point to terminal point would be right there. Now again, this is what is called a, a vector, a directed line segment. And so when you get an opportunity, everyone, we're going to go from here to here, and we're going to go ahead and draw an arrow. Initial point to terminal point, following the directions illustrated by this right up here negative 5i plus 2j. And that's it. Nice and easy. Uh, again, just one thing to note on this before kind of moving on to the next piece, but basically, could I have started here and gone 5 left and 2 up and drawn my same vector? Sure. And it would look the exact same. So as I mentioned, you can theoretically start anywhere you'd like. For our purposes, I believe starting at the origin will be the easiest. All right, good. So uh, we'll probably do another one in just a second, add a second vector on top of that. But for right now, what we need to do is kind of talk about the magnitude, which, uh, as I said, we're going to talk about size and direction here. So the magnitude is the vocabulary word for the size of our vector. And uh, in this case, the size of the vector is how far it is from here to here, basically the length of our vector. And so I guess I would ask you to think about this for a second. Could you tell me what the size of this vector is from here to here? How far is it from initial point to terminal point? Don't know if it would help or not, but I'm going to go ahead and drop that on down, kind of like this, and sort of formulate this piece right here. Again, not entirely sure if that helps, but that sort of direct distance from here to here um, is really the hypotenuse of a nice right triangle, of course, which we've seen so many times over. And horizontal component was five units to the left. Vertical component was two units up. Could I probably do a little Pythagorean theorem on that and come up with the magnitude? Sure. And so, uh, as I said, we, we have seen this exact calculation before, but basically it's the horizontal part squared, the vertical part squared, equals the direct distance squared. And so there is our magnitude. A squared plus B squared underneath that root. And so uh, I think I said this would be the third time kind of seeing very similar mathematics in action. And so there it is. Definitely have seen that before. Okay, good. Well, let's go ahead and do the example two that's on your paper here. And um, we'll obviously do a magnitude in just a couple minutes. But um, we're going to do a lot with adding vectors together. So example two, it says let V equals 4I plus 3J u is equal to 2i minus 1j, and we're going to do what's called find the resultant. And so the resultant to everybody is going to be the sum of the two vectors. Now the beautiful thing about the algebraic representation is all we have to do is it's almost like combining like terms. So if I want to add two vectors together in this form, very simply, guys, I just need to go ahead and add the horizontal components together and add the vertical components together. And so as a result here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write it all out here. If you want to shortcut this, you're more than welcome to. But basically, I'm going to add these two together, kind of like this. 
and then plus the second one, so 2i minus, I'm going to put a 1 there just for our purposes. And so that's all I'm doing. I'm adding them together. And as you can see, it's almost like I have these like terms that want to be combined. And so in essence, I get 4i and 2i to make 6i, and a 3j and a negative 1j to make 2j. And so I hope everyone's comfortable with that piece, is when we have the horizontal and verticals together, all I need to do is combine the like terms. I combine the horizontals, and then I combine the verticals. So this would be v plus u, and I'm going to box this up here just for our purposes, is equal to 6i plus 2j. All right. Now, what we're going to do is kind of confirm this from a more visual perspective, and that's what Part B says on your paper. It does say com uh, confirm graphically. So we're going to take basically one vector and add it on to a second vector. So let's go ahead and, and kind of graph both those vectors like we did in example one, and then kind of see one on top of the other and see what happens. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start at my origin right here, everyone, and you do the same, please. And very simply, I'm going to follow the directions for vector v. Vector v tells me to go four units horizontally and three units vertically. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do to go from initial point to terminal point. So everybody with me, four horizontally and three vertically. And there is my secondary point. And I'm going to go ahead and do that right there. And I'm going to label that vector v. Just put a little v up there just for our purposes right now. All right, so that is vector v. Now, as a matter of fact, vector u has directions to go horizontally and vertically. So I'm going to do this a couple different ways. I'm going to start from the origin, same thing. Just seems like a good place for me to begin. And I'm going to go two to the right. Everybody do it as well. And then one unit down. So two right and one down. And essentially, you would get this right here. And that would be vector u. Now, what I would like to do is see this from a more geometric standpoint. And it does say confirm our answer, which is this right here, by the way. We want to confirm that answer um, graphically. And so here's what I'm going to do. And I, I'm going to think about this in terms of adding one vector on top of the second vector. Here, it's kind of tough to tell exactly what that would look like. But basically, what I'm going to do now is take this secondary one and I'm going to move it. And so here's the premise, everyone. If you would, start at the initial point, and vector v told us to go 4 and 3, to go from here to here. So what I'm going to do is start right there. I'm sorry, stop right there. But then I'm going to start right there and use my secondary vector and go ahead and figure out where that would lead us. And so if you looked at, look at vector u, it tells us to go two units to the right and one unit down. So basically what I'm doing, everyone, is taking this vector right here. I hope you can see it. And I'm going to paste it right here. I'm going to move it so it sits one on top of the other. Okay, so we do vector v, just one more time on that. And then I'm adding vector u on top of vector v. So initial point, terminal point. But then this becomes the initial point of the second vector, and then I stop here and I get my terminal point. And in reality, everybody, what happens is then you've added two vectors on top of the, uh, one on top of the other, I should say, and you've created the sum of the two. This would be v plus u. Now, if you look at that dotted directed line segment, starting here and ending here, could you go ahead and give me the horizontal and vertical components of it? Could you represent that algebraically? Well, let's take a look, everybody. From here to here. Horizontal, I would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Vertical, 1, 2. And so this would be 6i and 2j. So there are a couple different ways to talk about what is, what is called the resultant vector, the sum of two vectors. You can kind of see it here, and that would be the resultant. Or I like kind of this piece, adding one on top of the other, and you end up here. Hope that works. We'll be doing a, a lot of that, just combining vectors together and then talking about the, the two major characteristics, the size and the vector. I'm sorry, the size and the direction, excuse me. Now, if you look at part C, there's that 
first one at least in action. It does say find the magnitude of the resultant. And so everyone here is the resultant right here, 6i plus 2j. Resultant just means the sum vector. And so remember, nice and easy. It looks like we get 6 squared plus 2 squared. And that's it, just the horizontal plus the vertical. All right, so 6 squared plus 2 squared equals that squared. And so I think we get a root 40 here. And you could leave that as root 40. I think for our purposes, we will probably go ahead and start getting decimal approximations. So I'm going to bring my calculator up. Obviously, this should somewhere be around 6 and something there. So let's see, root 40, eh, about 6.3, 6.4, yeah, there we go. And so about 6.32 units. That would be the size or the magnitude of the resultant vector. Okay. Hope everyone's okay with that piece, just kind of seeing the geometrical component to it, and then we'll go to the next. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, what we're going to try to do is create more of a trigonometric perspective dealing with vectors, and so that's what the investigation at the top of your page says, uh, representing vectors using trigonometric ratios. So let's go ahead and pull this off here together. We're going to go ahead and just draw a little diagram, one that we've definitely seen before, and then uh, draw a little conclusion from it. Okay, everyone, here we go. So uh, if you would, give me a coordinate plane here, just nice and easy, something like that would do. And I'm going to go ahead and start my initial point of the vector right at the origin. If you could do the same, that would be great. And then just a directed line segment anywhere up into the first quadrant should do something like this. So initial point to terminal point, something like that. And if you kind of notice, of course, uh, I've already drawn it in place, but I'll go ahead and do it again. I'm going to drop my perpendicular on down. And the way we represented this algebraically is this vector is made up of how far we go over horizontal, how far we go up vertical, and both denoted numerically by A and B. If you can throw that into the mix, that would be great. Now, of course, you also see, because of the nature of these three components, that there is an angle in standard position right there. We're going to call that our theta. And there is the direct distance from here to here, or the size of our vector. And by the way, the size, or I should say the magnitude of our vector has these double bars around it. So this would be the magnitude of V. So again, almost looks like absolute value around, but it's a double, so sort of a double vertical bars around the V. And so this would be the magnitude of V from here to here. And again, we got that by doing A squared plus B squared underneath the root. Excellent. Well, now that we've included that angle in place, um, we've seen this before, of course, where every angle has six ratios that go with it based on three parts, the horizontal, the vertical, and the direct. Just this would be the notation when dealing with vectors on the horizontal, vertical, and direct. And so we can kind of lay out a couple of our, of our trig ratios. I'm going to do cosine first, if that's all right. So the cosine of theta. And as we all know, cosine of theta is the horizontal over the direct. And so I'm going to go ahead and do this right here. So it's A over the magnitude. And I've done this before, so it shouldn't come as a great shock. But everybody, what I'm going to basically do is take that magnitude and bring it on up. And so you see that the A value, the horizontal value that we get in our algebraic representation of vectors, is really just equivalent to the magnitude times the cosine of theta. Nice. All right. Now, I'm going to do a secondary one. I'm going to do sine next, by the way. So sine of theta in my diagram would be the vertical over the direct. There they are. And so let's go ahead and do sine of theta equals B over the magnitude of theta. And I've done it before, so you can see me doing this again. Uh, that magnitude is coming up. And you see the B value, really the numerical value for how far we go up or down in our vector, is equivalent to the magnitude times the sine of theta. And we've seen this exact math before, just in a different context. But now what we're going to do here is replace A with this, and we're going to replace B with that right there. 
Okay. Now I'm going to throw another one into the mix, just the third primary ratio, of course. We're going to have to talk about theta dealing with A and B. And so remember, tangent of theta, everybody, is always the vertical over the horizontal. And just as you're going to see this a little later on, just don't forget this piece. So that would mean theta is equal to an inverse tangent. If you want to write that in there, you're more than welcome to. But something like that would do. That will come up in just a little bit. But I think I'll focus on these primary ones right here, just these two, because what we're going to do is see that A is really this and B is really this. And so we have a way to kind of talk about the relationship between the size and direction, so that's the magnitude and our theta, and the horizontal part and the vertical part. All right, well, let's throw our conclusion in here and try a couple examples with it. So here's our vector, everybody. The way we represented it algebraically was this right over here, AI plus BJ. So A tells us how far to go horizontally, and I backs that up. B how, tells us numerically how far to go vertically, and J backs that up. Well, what we've just now seen is that those A and B values can be replaced, substituted, connected to the magnitude and theta. And so A, everybody, is this. A is the magnitude times the cosine of theta. So let's put a little I on the back, obviously kind of to denote that that will move us horizontally. And then the B value, that numerical value to tell us where to go vertically, is really the magnitude and the sine of theta. And then the J, of course, reinforces the fact or really tells us that we're going vertically. So magnitude cosine of theta I and magnitude sine of theta J. And that's exactly how we're going to work with the trig. Okay. Hope everyone's all right, comfortable with the, seeing that connection right up there. It all comes from this diagram, which we have seen time and time again uh, during this semester. Okay. Well, let's... Uh, Let's do just two more examples with this. One just nice and straightforward one here, and, um, and then just a really good one to kind of wrap it up, put it all together. So example three on your paper, it just says the wind is blowing at 25 miles per hour in the direction of 45 degrees east of north. Express its velocity as a vector in terms of i and j. All right, wonderful. So let's go ahead and see this in action. It's always good to be visual with this. And so we have a, has a size, in this case, the magnitude is the velocity of the wind, and direction, in this case, it's at a, as a bearing, but we'll go ahead and figure out what theta is as well. And so in this case, let's go ahead and start with that bearing, 45 degrees east of north. So everyone start at the north line right up here and rotate 45 degrees for me. And let's go ahead and draw eesh, our terminal side, kind of looking like that, just out into the distance there. So basically from there to there, there's our vector. And again, that vector has a size and a direction. The size or the magnitude is the 25 miles an hour. So everyone, if you could put 25 right in there, that would be great. Now, the direction was given as a bearing, but for us to, uh, to do our trig, we do need the theta right in there. Now, it just so happens, of course, that if this is 45 degrees right in here, then our theta, and just make sure you're comfortable with this piece, finding that theta, then the theta is also 45 degrees. So we have the two components. We have the magnitude of our vector, and we have the direction of our vector, size and direction. Okay, good. So now what we're going to do is just represent this, uh, this vector, the velocity, as a vector in terms of i and j. So everyone, if you would... We're going to find A, we're going to find B, knowing that A is very simply 25 times the cosine of 45 degrees, and then the I means that that's horizontal, and then, of course, the B value is 25 and the sine of 45 degrees, and again, the J just tells us that that's vertical. And that's pretty much it right here. We'll try to derive a little meaning with this momentarily, but, you know, this is pretty much our A value, and this is our B value, exactly what you saw above, just trying to reinforce that piece. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my calculator. I mean, we know the cosine of 45 degrees, and we know the sine of 45 degrees specifically, but I'm going to go ahead and, and just get a decimal approximation on this for our time being here. 
So first order business is just make sure you're in degree mode. As I do see, we're going to have to go ahead and take cosine and sine of 45 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that. And then let's go ahead and do 25 cosine 45. Good. And then I'll do the same right up here just while I have um, the, the calculator in front of me, 25 and the sine of 45 degrees. And then I get the same thing, of course, because we do know cosine and sine of 45 degrees is identical. That root 2 over 2, of course. All right, so uh, let's see. We've got about 17.68. So when all is said and done, I have 17.68i and 17.68j. Wonderful. Okay, now just in terms of uh, deriving a touch of meaning with this before going on and doing our last example of the day, what this means, of course, is if the wind is blowing 25 miles per hour, at this angle right here, then the wind is blowing about 17.68 miles per hour horizontally and 17.68 miles per hour vertically. So this piece right in here would be the horizontal component, and this piece right in here would be the vertical component. That's pretty much what it's saying. So again, the wind is blowing this many miles per hour horizontally and this many miles per hour vertically to make up that vector right there. Nice. So all our vectors are composed of the horizontal piece and the vertical piece. Wonderful. OK, let's do one more. So this really kind of puts it all together, I believe. And so we'll go ahead and kind of do this right here. Uh, it says, use the graphical representation of the two vectors to answer the following questions. And so what we're going to do is, is do the conversion again using the trigonometry to write both vectors in AI plus BJ. Then what we're going to do is write a vector for the resultant force. Then after that, we're going to find the magnitude of that resultant force and the direction of the resultant force. So this, the nature of this essentially is going to be two forces acting on an object. One with a, a magnitude of 10, and I believe, if, uh, if I remember correctly, this would be 10 pounds at um, an angle of 72 degrees. This one right here acting on the same object uh, with a magnitude of 30 pounds coming in in a different direction, in this case coming in with a, with a theta of 25 degrees. So two different forces acting on an object. What we're going to do is add those two forces together and get the combined magnitude and combined direction. Okay. Now, unfortunately, when I say combined magnitude, unfortunately, we can't just take 10 and 30 and add those two magnitudes together to get a magnitude of 40. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work. So what we're going to have to do is, unfortunately, write these in AI plus BJ and then go from there. So by the way, just uh, let's do this geometrically even before I jump into part A. When we talk about the resultant here, we've seen this before, another way to really talk about the resultant is take the secondary one, and that's what I'm going to do up here, and kind of add it on top of that first one. So it's not going to be ideal, but it would look something like this. So this is the first vector, and then I add the secondary vector on top of it, something right there. And so ultimately, this, I believe, is what we're going to be looking for. So from there to there is the resultant. And so you can see it does have a larger magnitude, and the angle is somewhere in between these two, which of course we'll find uh, in just a couple minutes. Good. Well, in order to do this, as mentioned, uh, we'll go have to go ahead and write each one in AI plus BJ. So everyone, if you would, give me an F1 and an F2. And I just initially called this force one, not that it matters a whole lot. But what I'm going to do is exactly what I did from the previous example. So let's get comfortable doing this. It's magnitude cosine of theta. And then there's the I. And then everyone, it's magnitude sine of theta. And there's your J. So we're going to get those two pieces. And let me go ahead and put the other one in so I can maybe take care of all of it at once but we'll just see how that goes. The secondary force, magnitude was 10, and that direction angle was 72 degrees, so it's 10 cosine of 72 degrees I, and then it's 10 
sine of 72 degrees J. So exactly what we demonstrated up above on your sheet. What we're going to have to do, everyone, is grab a calculator and find our A values, find our B values, then we can start combining together. All right, so I'm going to bring my calculator up and just do some stuff up here, and uh, we'll see what happens. You do it as well, please. Make sure you're um, getting the same values that I get. So I'm going to do my 30 cosine 25. And so it's about 27.19. Now, again, we should bring this into perspective here. What that means is the horizontal component of that first vector is about 27.19 units. So if this is 30, this is about 27.19. I can definitely see that pretty far out there, close to that 30. And then 30 sine 25, let's get that, is about 12.68. So again, about 27.19 over and about 12.68 up. And that looks like a nice representation that seems to make pretty good sense there. So I'm going to go ahead and write that right here. Let me see if I have that piece. Oh, I have it uh, a little off, so I'm going to have to bring my calculator back up. So what do we say? 27.19 I, and then I think it was about 12.68. I will confirm that momentarily. So about 12.68J. So there's the first one. Okay, and again, let me confirm. Good, so 12.68J. Nice. Now, everyone, let's repeat. So what's the horizontal and vertical component on this? It looks like a very small horizontal, doesn't it? And it looks like a fairly large vertical compared to the 10, of course. So let's see if that uh, kind of works out with what we see. So I'm going to go ahead and do 10 cosine 72. There we go. Again, small horizontal there, about 309. And then uh, same thing, let's do 10 sine 72 and get that J, about 9.51. And so you can see that here, 3 over roughly, about 9.5 up, and that's what makes that vector right there. So I get 3.09i, and then I think I saw about 9.51J. Okay, very nice. So those are the two, AI plus BJ, horizontal and vertical components on both. All right, now everybody, we're able to do part B. It says write a vector for the resultant force. So like we did on the front side of your paper, I can add this and this together by adding the horizontals and then adding the verticals, like terms basically, and that would give it to me. So let's go ahead and do that piece. I'll go ahead and bring my calculator up. If you can go ahead and do this mentally, that's great. But let's just go ahead and make sure. So add the horizontal numerical values. So I get these two pieces right here. And so we get about 30.28. And then I'm going to go ahead and add the verticals, 12.58. And, oops, sorry, that's 12.68. Let me get that right and about 9.51. Okay, so we have 30.28i and 22.19j. Let's go ahead and write this. So this would be force one plus force two. And so I think I saw 30 and I missed it already. That's not good. So 30.28i and 22.19j. Let's get that on there. Okay, there it is. So that's how we represent what's called the resultant of the two vectors, the sum of the two vectors. And again, what that means basically is if you look at my dotted line right here, then I'm going over 30.28 and up 22.19 to get from here to here, horizontal and vertical. Okay, so we have two forces acting on an object. This one, just one more time, with a force of 10 pounds at an angle of 72 degrees. This one acting on the same object with a, a force of 30 pounds and um, an angle of 25 degrees. With those acting together, the combined force would be so many pounds, which we'll find momentarily, and the angle would be from here to here. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do it. 
magnitude, guys, nice and straightforward. So this would be this. I'm going to go ahead and try to make sure the notation matches up with everything I've taught during this lesson. Hey, guys, there's your magnitude, kind of the double bars around uh, our vector. So the magnitude of the resultant is equal to square root of 30.28 squared and 22.19 squared. All right, nice and easy. A little a squared plus b squared gets us there. I'm going to grab my calculator and do it again. So we have 30.28 squared and let's see, what do we say? 22.19 squared. Got that looking great. How about a little square root on that, everyone? And there we go. So the, the force... The magnitude of that combined force is about 37.54 pounds. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put that right over here. And again, the unit that I've seen with these problems would be that. Okay. Now you can see the angle is somewhere in between this piece, the 25 degrees, and the 72 degrees. It's somewhere in there. And it looks like it's going to be closer to the 25 degrees compared to the 72 degrees, just because this magnitude is far greater than this magnitude. But um, hey, let's go ahead and figure it out. So we haven't done this specifically yet, but it is time to go ahead and pull this off. Uh, we've done it before where if I know the vertical and I know the horizontal, it's just inverse tangent. Because I know, everyone, this is about 30.28. This is about 22.19, and if I do an inverse tangent on the vertical over the horizontal, it should give it to me. So let's go ahead and do that piece. Inverse tangent, 22.19, 30.28, and let's go ahead and find out what that angle is. Again, I, I haven't seen this problem before, but I would assume we're definitely going to be closer to the 25 degrees. Um, instead of the 72 degrees, just because the magnitude on the 25 degree vector is quite a bit greater. So let's go ahead and see. Inverse tangent. 22.19, and then divide that by and 30.28. All right, I hit enter, and there we go. So that angle, that would be from here to here, is about 36.23 degrees. All right, let's throw that in. All right, so you're going to be doing a lot of applications that kind of deal with this type of mathematics. So really look over example four in a lot of detail before moving forward with it. Really, it comes down to four parts. Write each vector in AI plus BJ. Then combine, like terms, A's and B's. And once you get your resultant vector, then you can get the two characteristics that we've been talking about, the size or the magnitude of the vector and the direction of the vector. All right, perfect. Hey, of course, just let me know if you have some questions on this as you're working through some problems. And thanks again for listening, of course.